cannot hold on to our salvation but then we saw from the word of God that we are not the ones uh, who is uh, keeping our salvation it's the Lord Jesus Christ we are in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ we are in the hands of the Father and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit and then Paul says that he committed that he knew that the Lord will be able to keep that which he had committed unto him against that day so therefore our salvation is eternally secured amen but if we, we will be the ones to keep our salvation then we will lose it every day because truly we are weak we are frail and we often stumble and fall but praise God when he saved us he's the one who is keeping our salvation that's why the Bible says he is the author and the finisher of our faith it is not our part to save ourselves it is not our part to continue keeping ourselves saved it is the work of God now when we got saved he created us unto good works so our part is to be uh, grateful to him by doing good works so that is the part that was given to us and it is also a proof that we are really saved because a person because uh, a saved person was born again if we are born in the spirit then we are going to live in the spirit much the same as when you are born in the flesh you're going to be living in the flesh and physical physical birth will produce a physical uh, fruits meaning to say you will start to crawl to sit down to stand up to walk it is a sign of life you will breathe the same thing uh, with spiritual birth there is a sign of life and th that sign is you're going to serve God and you're going to produce good works because of the new birth that was given to us and then we also look at several scriptures that seem to teach that salvation can be lost but we saw we found out yesterday that those verses are talking about a different dispensation or they're talking about works and rewards or service but never about salvation and then we also look at Hebrews chapter 6 and chapter 10 the two most uh, debated uh, chapters and passages when it comes to losing salvation and we found out yesterday that the author is talking to the Jews who some might have believed or some came to the knowledge of the truth but they reverted back to their old Judaistic way that's why we will see the Apostle Paul when he wrote to Galatians and other epistles he's trying to rebuke the believers by allowing the Judaizer to come and to believe in their teaching because we know that the Judaizer whenever they come they will tell the Gentile Christian that in order for you to really be saved you need to be circumcised because circumcision is the mark of Jewish belief so they are trying to incorporate circumcision or works into the grace that was already wrought by the Lord Jesus Christ in the heart of the people and since the Jews are very influential when it comes to religion when it comes to teaching spiritual things these Gentiles are quite intimidated whenever this Judaizer will come and will teach them the ways of uh, uh, Judaism so that's why the Apostle Paul wrote them in order to make them understand that you are now saved there is nothing that you can do in order to keep yourself saved there is nothing that you can do to unsave yourself don't worry about it keep on serving God because you are now a child of God so that is what the Apostle Paul is trying to emphasize so we we're not able to finish yesterday so now we are going to the second part this is in regards to reasons given by the Word of God so that we can understand that a believer can never fall and a believer cannot lose his salvation shall we stand up and we will pray Heavenly Father we are so thankful for the lessons that you are giving us the lesson that we had yesterday we thank you Lord because even though there are people who may be teaching erroneous doctrine we thank you because there is your word here is your word which is our final authority we can always consult your word we can always go to your word and you can always Lord give us the right answer 
and the right teaching and the right understanding because of the help of the Holy Spirit. Even at this time, O oh God, as we study about the reasons why we can never be lost anymore, why we cannot lose our salvation, why we cannot perpetually fall away, help us, Lord, to understand this so that this thing about eternal security will forever be settled in our hearts and we can concentrate on deeper things in serving you, O oh God. So I pray that after this lesson, the devil will not be able to bother us anymore regarding what you have done in our hearts when we repented of our sins and receive you as our Lord and Savior. Even today, bless us as we study. Help me, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Okay. So there are several uh, things that we can read from the Word of God to give us a, an absolute foolproof assurance that once you are a believer, again, a believer is a person who repented of his sins and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, a believer is the one who was born again. John chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 7. And a believer, according to 1 John 1, 7, is a person who was washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So a believer is simply a child of God. He belongs to the family of God. We are born from above. We are spiritually born. So that is a believer. So if you are a believer, this is what happens so that we can be sure that what God has given us will remain with us and will never be taken away from us. Number one, the believer is eternally secured because of the eternal purpose of God concerning his redeemed people. Because of the eternal purpose of God concerning his redeemed people. Let us look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 4. The Bible says, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So He has chosen us according to His foreknowledge. He knew that one day we are going to hear the gospel. He knew that one day we are going to understand the gospel. He knew that one day we will be convicted by the Holy Spirit of our sin. He knew that the time will come that we will be convicted of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that conviction, it will result in our repentance, opening our heart and receiving Jesus as our Savior. He knew that. And because He knew that, He elected us. And as He elected us, the Bible says that He had chosen us to live holy life without blame before Him in love. So when we got saved, we are not yet holy in our disposition. But because it is the purpose of God, He intends for us to pass through what we call sanctification, wherein every day we are being cleansed by the Word of God. So every day in our lives, almost every day in our lives, we will see but the manifestation of changes from a bad person or a worse person to becoming a better person. So we are becoming holy every day because we are being cleansed not only by His blood but by the Word, but that we are hearing from the Word of God. So this is His purpose. So there is what we call election, there is choosing, there is predestination. Look at Romans chapter 8 verses 29 to 30. Ito yan. For whom He did foreknow, you see? We were foreknown by God. He also did predestinate. So there is a destiny that we are going to go to whether we like it or not. Because it is predetermined that once we got saved, this will happen to us. So what is our predestination? To be conformed to the image of His Son. That is why, as I have said, in our lives, there is a slow change that is happening in our lives as we slowly conform to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning to say, 
we are not only that we are a new creature inside that is our divine nature but we are slowly conforming to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ we may not be able to reach uh, we will not be able to reach the exact image of the Lord Jesus Christ but we are conforming slowly surely to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ that is why if we are saved there will be changes in our lives if there are no changes it means that we do not have the Holy Spirit we are not saved we are not predestined to conform to the image of the Son of God look at verse number 30 moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called them he also justified and whom he justified them he also glorified so our final destination is glorification when we are if we will die and we will be released from this body this corruptible body when we get to heaven we will be given an incorruptible body conform to the image of Jesus who will never die anymore that is what we call eternal life that is what we call glorification we are going to have the same body of the Lord Jesus Christ of course not his divinity but the same body as he has who will never die anymore that's why in heaven the Bible says there is no more sickness there is no more pain nobody will get old anymore because we are in a body that is not bound by space and not bound by time in heaven there is no time because God is an eternal God and eternity simply defines that there is no past there is no future it is always an ever present now so that is what we're going to experience when we get to heaven and because this is the purpose of God therefore our salvation must be secured because if it is not secured how can we be glorified you understand that we are already predestinated to our final destination and that is heaven and our final body that is a glorified body a glimpse of this was during the uh, transfiguration when james peter and john were on top of, of the mountain with the lord jesus christ and the lord jesus christ was transfigured before them in his glorified body and they saw also moses and elijah in a body different from what they have because we, we know that moses died but he was there alive with a different body so that is the reason why our eternity is secured look at second timothy chapter 1 verse 9 second timothy chapter 1 verse number 9 who hath saved us and called us with an with unholy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in christ before the word began again choosing calling saving holy even before the word began so the purpose is already determined by god from eternity because of his foreknowledge first peter 1 2 elect according to the foreknowledge of god the father so it's becoming clearer now that our election is according to his foreknowledge because there is a danger that is going on right now that they say that god randomly uh, chose people to go to heaven and he randomly chose people to go to hell and there is nothing that those people can do if they are chosen they will whether they like it or not they will be saved if you're not chosen whether you like it or not you will not be saved that is what we call calvinism and that is what the bible is teaching when the john 3 16 is very clear for god so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him whosoever means it can be me it can be you it can be anybody else whosoever means we have a choice to receive or to reject the lord jesus christ that is the free will given to us that is why we do not force people the word of god we do not force people to come to church we do not force people to serve god 
we do not force people to repent of their sins and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because God has given people free will and what God has given to people, we must respect. Even though we want them to be safe. But we should not force them to salvation. Because force will never produce true or genuine faith. That is something that we need to understand. That is why if we are telling people to give whether they like it or not, to give their possession to the church whether they like it or not, it not it's not going to work because God loves it a cheerful giver and you cannot be cheerful if you are being forced to give. So that is something that we need to understand. That's why when you give, it should be coming from your heart. Because you understand, number one, that you are a steward. And number two, because you love God and you understand that there is a work that must be done. And because you are saved and a child of God, you want to be a part of what is happening in the program of God. So we are saved because of God's eternal purpose for the redeemed people. Number two, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ is eternal. The redemptive work of Jesus Christ is eternal. When Jesus saved us, that salvation is eternal. It is not a temporary salvation. It is not the salvation that we know in this world. If you are hungry, they will feed you. Then you can say that I am saved from hunger. But you will hunger again. It will happen again. But the salvation that God provided is something that will never be taken away from us. Do you remember the woman at the well? Jesus says, if you will drink of the water that I will give you, you will never thirst anymore. Not talking about physical thirst, but spiritual thirst. Eternal satisfaction to those who will believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us look at uh, Romans chapter 4. Verse number 25, and we will read on. Who was delivered for our offenses? The Lord Jesus Christ. He was delivered not for his offense, not for his sins, but for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. So you see, everything that Jesus Christ had done is not for himself. He died for us. He was raised for us. He was justified for us. So it is not, it is not uh, uh, for himself, but for us. That is why we call his death vicarious death. Dying in place of another. Paying our debt on the cross because we cannot afford to pay our debt. If we will pay it, then we will be in hell forever. So that is the very essence of salvation. Somebody dying for us, redeeming us from the doom that we are supposed to receive in our lives. Verse 26. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says before we are enemies of God. But when we are justified, meaning to say we repented of our sins, we believe Jesus died for us and we receive him as our Savior. There was a change of state. Now we have peace with God. We are now on the side of the Lord. Why? Because we agree with him. Before we agree with Satan when we are committing sin. But once we receive Jesus, we agree with God. And therefore we now have peace with God. Amen? Peace na, bati na. Hindi na magkaaway. Not enemies anymore. But there is now reconciliation. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the next verse. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So, what the Lord Jesus Christ did is sufficient. Why? Because it caused us to be justified. What do you mean by justification? Justification is a legal term. Whereby we are proclaimed 
righteous or not guilty. So therefore, if you are justified, you are not going to be condemned anymore. Look at Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation. Why? You're already justified. Even in the court of law, there is no such thing as double jeopardy. If you are proclaimed not guilty on that particular crime, you will not be tried or pro prosecuted for the same crime because you are justified. And then our crime will cause us to go to hell, but we were justified. Therefore, no more hell for us. That is why there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Why? We are now walking after the, uh, not, not the flesh, but after the Spirit because we have the Holy Spirit now living in our hearts. So that is why our salvation is secured because the work of Jesus is sufficient for us. Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse number 3. who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty of God. What did he do? He purged our sins, those who believe. And then he sat down. What is the significance of sitting down in the Bible? It connotes a finished work, a done deal. What has been done? Purging of our sins. That we are now cleansed from our sins and is now waiting for the time that He should come again and receive us unto Himself. John chapter 14, verse number 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. So he's just waiting for the time. And receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. Where was he? In my father's house. Where is the father's house? Heaven. So he will come again and receive those who believe, those who have eternal security, those who got saved, and then we will be brought into the presence of God, the Father in heaven. So that is a finished work, a finished transaction that Jesus had done on the cross of Calvary. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, 24 to 25. This is also clear. But this man... Because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost. Oh. Extreme. Sagad. Yung kaligtasan. He was able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Meaning to say, when the Lord Jesus Christ rose up, from the dead, he is alive forevermore and he is interceding for us. Therefore, nobody can touch the children of God. Amen. So don't you know any MC Hammer? Can't touch this. Can touch him. Because we are the children of God. Amen. So that is very clear from the Bible. And then, of course. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 10 to 14. We read this yesterday. But this is very good, very clear. So I hope that you are taking notes so that when people are asking you about eternal security or telling you that you can lose your salvation, you can give them these verse verses and it will silence them because it is the word of God. By which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So because of his offering... We are sanctified, set apart. Set apart for what? For Him and for Him alone. 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. This is what I'm telling you yesterday. The Jews are in what we call 
sacrificial religious system. They always go back to animal sacrifices in order for their sins to be atoned. But they do not understand that the sacrificial lie, uh, lamb that they are offering in the Old Testament during the Day of Atonement is pointing unto the Lord Jesus Christ. They thought it is something that they need to do forever or until the Messiah will come. The Messiah came, but they rejected Him. Because in their mind, the Messiah should come as a powerful person. But Jesus came as a lamb. They are expecting the Messiah to be the Lion of Judah, who will come roaring and defeating all His enemies. They did not understand that it will happen, but on the second coming. Meanwhile, He came the first time to die for our sins so that He can prepare a people for God. So that is what he did. But because they rejected the Savior, until now they are sacrificing for their salvation. That is why when Apostle Paul preached the gospel to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles got saved, this Judaizer who are Jews went to them and told them, what Paul told you is not enough. You need to do the sacrifices, you need to be circumcised, you need to do this on the Sabbath, you must not eat meat offered to idols, you must not do this, you must not do that going back to the Old Testament. But the Bible is very clear that can never take away sin. But this man, referring to Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, one forever sat down. You see, sat down again at the right hand of God. Finish work. Verse 13. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Reference to the second coming. And look at verse number 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So because of the offering of Jesus... We are already predestinated to be perfect. But not now. Because we are still going through the process of sanctification. Daily cleansing from the Word of God. But it is now our position in the Lord. So therefore, our, secu our eternity is secured. Amen? Therefore, our salvation is secured because of this. Number three. Sal uh, the reason why we cannot lose our salvation is because salvation is by grace. Because salvation is by grace. If it is by grace, then it is no more of work. Because grace will not be grace anymore. And if it is of work, then it is not by grace. Therefore, work will not be work anymore. So, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 is very clear regarding this. Let us look at it, please. This is very clear. For by grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor from God. We do not deserve it, but it was given to us. Okay, that's clear. That is grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith. So, what we did in order to be saved is to put our faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is all by grace. He does not have to die because we are all sinners, but He chose to die because He wants to save us. And that not of yourselves. So salvation has nothing to do with us. It is not our selves that produce salvation. Okay, uh, before we continue that, can we go to John chapter 1, verse uh, 12 to 14, so that this will become clearer. John 1, 12 to 14. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So, how did this happen? Verse number 13 is clear. It says, which were born not of blood. So, it, it has nothing to do with our birth. You cannot say that my mother and my father were Christians, they are saved, therefore I am saved because I, I was born from them. No. It is not by blood, nor of the will of the 
flesh. You cannot will yourself to salvation. But pastor, I thought that we have free will. Yes, we have free will. So therefore, I can uh, choose to be saved. Well, technically, yes. But before it happened, something must come first that is not your doing in order for you to will. What the, the, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You must first hear the word of God so that the word of God will produce faith in you. And when that faith is produced, then you are going to will by your own choosing to accept Jesus as your Savior. So it is not the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. I have children. I want them to be saved. For example, they're not yet saved. I cannot will them to be saved. It is their decision. It is not my decision. It is the work of God in them. It is not my work, but of God. So that is a why we were born. That is grace. That is putting our faith in the grace of God. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. To eight. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What's the significance of the word gift? It is something that you receive freely, without fee, without payment. Because when you paid for it, it is not a gift. It may be a salary, or it may be an income, or a bonus, but it is never a gift. A gift is something that you did not work for, but it was given to you freely. That is why salvation is free. You do not pay for your salvation. When they tell you, oh, you need to uh, pray this and pay us so that you will be saved. No, that's not true because salvation is free. That is the sad thing about our friends in the Catholic religion because they believe that you can buy your way to heaven. That's why when you, you die, they have to say mass for you, and then you're already dead. Yearly, they need to say mass for you, and mass is not free. You have to pay. And sadly, again, there is what we call normal mass and special mass. The special mass, uh, the, the, the fee is higher than the normal mass. Mass. And you have to do that again and again and again. And you ask the priest, for how long are we going to do this? Just keep on doing this because we do not know. Maybe they're still in purgatory. So there is no assurance at all. Nothing whatsoever. So you are going to pay for the rest of your life. And when you die, your, the, the children that you will left behind will do the same thing. And the same thing and the same thing. Just imagine the accumulation of the payment throughout your generation because until now they have to say mass for them because they should still be in purgatory for nobody according to what they believe can really be sure but the bible is very clear that salvation is a gift it is free i was in kabanatuan city and i was we are going house to house knocking on doors and then we gave a tract after that, the man said that, well, religion is uh, just about money. It is business. You want us to go to your church so that you can get money from us. I said, sir, no. Our, our desire is for you to understand the word of God, to understand the gospel so that you can be forgiven by God and you can be saved so that when we die, we will go to heaven and we will be with the Lord. No, 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 no. You pastors are becoming rich. You pastors are... I said, uh, sir... Since you are insisting, okay, let's talk. What is your religion, sir? He said, I am a Catholic. Okay, sir, it's like this. In our church, we have baptism. In your church, do you have baptism? He said, yes. In our church, baptism is free. How about in your church? There is a payment. Again, there is a normal baptism, and there is a special baptism. Number two. In our church, we do not have confirmation because... Once you are baptized, that's it. But in your church, there is a confirmation. In some churches, you have to pay. In some churches, you do not have to pay. But during the confirmation, you have to be slapped. It's like this. 
during the confirmation, uh, they will uh, come forward and then, because when you were baptized, you do not know it. So now that you're in the age of understanding, you need to confirm that you really want to be a Catholic. So are you confirming? Yes. I do not know why. They have to slap. Maybe the answer is wrong. Do you confirm? Yes. Go. In other churches, they actually slap them at the back of the head. You saw, uh, did you see that uh, uh, on uh, YouTube? That is how they do it. In our church, we do not. But if you want, we can, make, we can arrange for a schedule. Anybody wants to be confirmed today? Nobody? Okay. Next, I told him, during wedding, we have wedding in our church, the couple do not have to pay. In your church, do you have wedding? He said, yes. Do they have to pay? Yes. Again, there are two kinds. Normal wedding and en grande or grand wedding. Different payment. Do people... In our, in our church, people die. Do people in your church die? He said, yes. Okay. When, when we have a dead, in our, uh, dead person in our church, we go and we bury them. No payment. How about in your church? If they were brought to the church, the priest will bless and they have to pay. After we bury them, finish. But after you bury them in your church, you have to say mass every year, yes or no? He said, yes. Okay. Your, your uh, baptism, you must pay. Confirmation, you must pay. Marriage, you must pay. Extreme unction, you must pay. They're already dead. You still have to pay. In our church, all free. Now, who is doing the business part? Your church or our church? And he could not say anything. You see, salvation is a gift. It is not for sale. You may have millions. I remember the, the Queen of England is about to die. I do not know uh, which queen. But he said to the doctor, Doctor, a million pounds for a day of life. And the doctor said, I'm sorry, Your Highness. Your money cannot buy you time on earth. Why? Salvation is a gift. You cannot buy your way to heaven. Verse number 9. Not only that, not of works. You cannot be saved by your works. People are doing good because they believe that their good works can merit them salvation. If you can work your way to salvation, then salvation is no more grace. Because grace is unmerited favor. And no matter how you work, even though you do many good works, it will be negated by the sin that you have committed because the wages of sin is death. Okay, for example, Brother Wilson, you lived for 50 years. You did good for 49 years, 364 days. But one day in your life, you killed a man. Are you going to jail or not? No, but you are good. Your, your good works outweigh your bad works. Because uh, I've been living good for 49 years and 364 days. I only killed uh, a person just one day in my life. But that will be enough to send you to jail. Because you broke the law. The same thing with us. No matter if you do good works all, all of your life, but you fail once in your life to do what is good, you have broken the law. And therefore, there is a penalty. That is why when Jesus died, he died for all our sins so that we do not have to pay anymore. Why? Why not of works? Lest any man should boast because God knew who we are. We are boastful people. So rich people sometimes they cannot even bend their heads when they walk. Why? Because they're rich. You cannot reach them. Because they're rich when they accomplish something. Gold medalists. 
when you uh, make a three-point shot and beat the buzzer and you won the game. People are boastful. So if you can work your way to heaven and you're in heaven because of your work and then the Lord Jesus Christ saw you and he said, will you worship me? And you said, why? I work my way to heaven. Who are you? I see. That's why it is not of our works. So that there will be no more boasting. But after we got saved, look at verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, because we are saved, we will naturally do that which is good. Why? Which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. That is the purpose of our salvation. That's why we will continue to be saved because we need to produce good works and our salvation is only by the grace of God. Amen? Look at Titus 3, 3, 5. This is also very clear. These are verses that you need to understand regarding assurance of salvation. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. You see? It corroborated what was mentioned in Ephesians chapter 2. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Another word, mercy. What is grace? Unmerited favor. God giving us what we do not deserve. Amen? What is mercy? Mercy is forgiveness. God not giving us what we deserve, which is hell. But we were forgiven. But according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So if our salvation is depending on ourselves, no doubt we will lose it, but thank God. It is about the work of God. Amen? So pastor, this is what I really could not understand. Why is it that when I got saved, even if I will do bad works, or even if I commit sin, why is it that I'm still saved? That is something that is bothering the mind of so many people. Actually, to be honest, when I got saved, that is the, the very thing that is bothering my mind. How can I still be saved if I committed sin after I got saved? Because the wages of sin is death. So, what I did not understand is this. When God paid for all our sins, He paid for our sins, past sins, present sins, and future sins sins. And then another question came into my mind. So, I understand that when I received Jesus Christ May 14, 1986, He had forgiven me of all my sins. But what about the sin that I will commit from May 15 and so on? Because they are all future sins. And then I realized that Jesus Christ died in AD 33. And all my sins are future. Because I committed them when I was born in 1963, so maybe 1970, when I was in the age of accountability. Until now, all of my sins are future, and yet it was forgiven. So what is the difference of the sin in 2020, 21, 22, 23, and so on, until I am alive? You see? So now, again, so if you are saved, you can just continue in sin. No, because there is chastisement. Like for example, uh, Millie is our daughter. When Millie was born, she was already a madlang awa. And there is nothing that we can do to make her unborn. She's now a part of our family. Now, there are only two things. She can be a good member of our family or a bad member of our family. If she will be a good member of our family, she will receive rewards. But if she will be a bad member of the family, she will be disciplined. So the same thing with us. When we were born into the family of God, we are already God's children and there is nothing that can remove us from the family of God. But whenever we commit sin, according to Hebrews chapter 12, God will have to step in and chastise us so that we will learn our lesson and go back to the right path. So that is how it works. So do not worry about it. God has taken care of it. 
But the sins that we will commit, God is also taking care of it. God will see to it. Whenever I spank John, I see to it that he understands what really happened. I really spank him to the point that it will really be very, very painful that he will put in his mind, I am not going to do it again. Because if we did it again, the next spanking will be more painful until the time that he said, I just have to submit. Because anyway, what my dad wants me to do is right. The same thing with us. We just have to submit because anyway, what God wants us to do is right. And it is for our good. So therefore, our security is secured. Security is secured. That's good. Eternity is secured because it is all by grace. Number four, because of the nature of salvation. This is very simple and very clear. What is salvation? John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whosoever believeth in Him, believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How long is everlasting? Just define it. So that is the life that is given to us by God. When will eternity end? It will never end. Therefore, our salvation will never end. Because that is the very nature of, salva nature of salvation. Eternal life. Everlasting life. Life without end. That is what was given to us by God. Look at uh, John 5.24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. What will happen to those people with everlasting life? And he shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death. What death? Hell, eternal death, pass from death unto life. So we will not go to hell anymore. We already passed that and we will be in heaven by the grace of God. So that is the nature of our salvation. Eternal, eternity. Uh, they, they, uh, a person was asked, can you, how can you describe eternity? It's like this. You get a small bird and ask that bird to uh, pick a uh, sand on the seashore and then that bird will fly to the moon until that bird has uh, transported all the sand to the moon and then he will uh, transport them back to the earth and when he had done it it is just the start of eternity so that is our salvation. It will never end. It will never stop. It will be with us forever. Now, Satan will not just let us understand and, 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 and accept the word of God. He will always do something that will make us doubt. So, Satan said it's like this. Uh, can I ask you to stand up? Can I ask you to stand up, my brother? It's an example. This is you. This is eternal life. eternal life this is eternal life so you re he repented of his sins and accepted received the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior so now he has eternal life so now eternal life is in his possession but the charismatic and other cults Pentecostal taught it like this yes you have eternal life and the eternal life is in you but when you committed sin eternal life will be taken away from you so therefore you do not have eternal life anymore because you committed sin this is the problem that can be logical right it can be logical because okay eternal life well now you have it because you received jesus christ but you committed sin so eternal life is taken away from you so eternal life is still eternal it will never end but it is not in your possession anymore that is how they logically explain it. But the problem is this. Salvation is not only receiving eternal life. 
Salvation is being regenerated, being born into the family of God. Salvation is not only receiving eternal life. Salvation is not only being born into the family of God. But salvation is justification. Salvation is propitiation. Salvation is so many things that happen in the life of a person that you cannot logically explain it away because you have to explain everything away. So, the next, my, my question to that person who said it is that, when you received Jesus, were you born into the family of God? He said, yes. What can you do in order for you to be unborn from the family of God? What can you do in your family that can make you be unborn from your family? I said, no. When you are born into your family, you are forever forever a part of your family. The same thing with salvation. So when God has given you eternal life, it is not something that God will take away if you will commit sin. Why? Because He already justified you. And that justification will make eternal life remain in you forever. Because there is no such thing as, as I have said a while ago, double jeopardy. You cannot be condemned anymore. You are passed from that condemnation. Thank you. So that is the etern the nature of our salvation. Okay, let's go past three more. Number five. Salvation is secure because of the promises and statements that guarantee security. There are so many, like for example, this one. It guarantees our security. John 5:24. Let us look at uh, John 6:37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So we cannot be cast out anymore. We will remain with him forever. Look at uh, Philippians 1.6. This is very clear. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus. So when God saved you, that is a good work in us and He will continue doing that until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So our salvation is very secured. Number six. Because of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. When you are saved, you are in Him. And He in us. So if we are in Him and He in us, Therefore, wherever he goes, there we will also go. Because we are now going to be inseparable. Pastor, is that really possible? Yes, uh, for the last uh, reason. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our eternal life. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. And this is very, very clear. In whom ye also trusted. You did this, Amen. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believe, ye were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Seal means what? Possession. When there is a seal, it means you belong to whoever have that seal. If I will put property of Joel Madlangawa, if even it landed in your room, it belongs to me unless I have given it to you. So we are already sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And what is the sealing? Look at verse number 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. Do you know what earnest is? It is assurance money. If you give an earnest money, it means that you're going to buy it. Don't sell it to anybody. This is the earnest money. I will come back with the full payment. I will buy it. So when somebody received the earnest money, he is not legally bound to sell it to anybody else. And because we are sealed, that seal is the earnest of what? Our inheritance until the redemption and the purchase possession unto the praise of His glory because we are purchased by God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. So we belong to the person who bought us. Amen? 
Therefore glorify, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. So now we belong to Jesus. We have a song. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the year of time alone, but for eternity. So we are eternally His. And He is eternally mine. So that is what happened. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit that is in us. So what is that ministry? And how long will the Holy Spirit remain in us? Look at John 14, 16. You see, when you are reading all of these verses, it should bring much joy and assurance in our hearts. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter. Who is another comforter? The Holy Spirit. That He may abide with you forever. So we will love the Holy Spirit forever. Therefore, we are saved forever. So that these are the reasons why we can be sure that when we die, we will go to heaven. We can be sure that we will not fall away perpetually. We can be sure that no matter what happens in our lives, all things work together for good because God is working in us. And finally, John Romans 8, 33 to 39. And this is very uh, amazing, beautiful, wonderful verses. Who shall lay anything to the church of God's elect? <laughs> Who will lay anything against us? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. So how can they condemn us when Christ died for us? Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, He's now our defense lawyer. And how can we lose a case if we have Jesus as our defense lawyer? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted the sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Name it. It cannot separate us from Jesus. Amen? That is why our salvation is secured. Because no one will be able to separate us from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I hope and I pray that this really cemented our understanding of eternal security and that from now on, the devil will not be able to bother us anymore. Just be sure that we are saved in the first place. Because if we are saved, then we are safe forevermore. Shall we stand up, please? Heavenly